Welcome to Curing with Sound, a podcast presented by the Focus Ultrasound Foundation. I'm your host, Allison Preston Smith. A pioneer in the field of Focus Ultrasound, Dr. Daniel Jean Minaud has dedicated his career to unraveling the complexities of neurological movement disorders and neuropathic pain. In this conversation, we reflect on his legacy upon his retirement. In 2008, alongside his colleague, Professor Ernst Martin, he conducted the world's first series of focus ultrasound interventions for neuropathic pain, a groundbreaking achievement that laid the foundation for transformative developments in the field. He founded the Sana Model Center of Ultrasound Functional Neurosurgery in Zurich, Switzerland in 2010, which recently closed its doors after nearly 15 years. He and his team completed 511 focus ultrasound interventions and sonicated 665 targets. Additionally, he led several world-first clinical trials and has over 60 publications, further solidifying his status as a trailblazer. He graduated from the University of Lausanne, completing a doctoral thesis on neuroplasticity. He then trained in neurosurgery and later became the head of the Department of Functional Neurosurgery at the University Hospital of Zurich between 1989 and 2009. His interest is in the treatment of chronic and therapy-resistant functional brain disorders, including movement disorders, neuropathic pain and tinnitus, epilepsy, and neuropsychiatric disorders. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jean Minaud. Uh, Hello, Alison. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and thank you for being here. So before you learned of Focus Ultrasound, your three main areas of interest were in neuropathic pain, Parkinson's-related tremor, and essential tremor. So what kind of research were you doing at the time? I am since 1989 a so-called functional neurosurgeon. So we deal with uh, brain diseases that produce symptoms in the sense of overactivity of the brain. And uh, as you just mentioned, one of the main indications or situation we can treat and have to treat are the field of uh, neurogenic or neuropathic pain and movement disorders, including Parkinson and social trauma. And I've been uh, uh, working on this domain since 1989, um, technically using, at the time, the radio frequency stereotaxy. So using radio frequency lesioning in the brain to help gain these symptoms. So, and, and then came out to sound. And when did you first learn of focus ultrasound? Were you looking into other studies utilizing it? It, it, it must have been, I think, in 2004. At that time, I still remember a phone call by my colleague, Professor Els Martin, who as a radiologist said, had identified the potentialities of focus ultrasound. And uh, he knew that I was working in my field making tiny, millimeter-large uh, therapeutic lesion inside the brain, the middle of the brain. So he thought it would be an ideal situation to try and, and uh, explore. So he was essentially quite right indeed. And uh, we then came together and developed a whole research program uh, coming at the end to the uh, first trial performed in, that, in our case in neuropathic pain using focus ultrasound. I, I insist here that uh, the first persons and teams who were dressing the brain were, in fact, our colleagues in Boston, in Brigham Women's Hospital, who were the first to, to think about brain possibilities and working on brain tumors. So they were, they were really the pioneers. We had a feed that was very handy for this indication, small uh, tablet work in the middle of the brain, which really was a very favorable start. And before you even started utilizing Focus Ultrasound, in 1998, you received the Pfizer Research Prize. Could you tell us more about the research you were doing at that time and your findings? Yes, but exactly. They relate to what the mechanisms are that are the source of these symptoms and and diseases that I mentioned before, mainly abnormal movements and, and, and neuropathic pain. And we found, indeed, during intervention in all these symptoms, movement disorders, pain, also tinnitus, epilepsy, etc., the same special activity. We propose the term of thalamocortical dysrhythmia, which means improper or inadequate rhythmicity, 
which is in fact too much overactivity inside the brain. If an, uh, an area of the brain, which is a motor area, is affected by the symptom, we get abnormal movements. If it's a pain domain, we have neuropathic pain, etc. And how did that work inform what you did later on incorporating focus ultrasound? Did you rely on those findings a lot? In fact, the really the two main fields in, in, in my activities have been on this, understanding what the problem is and then doing something to help you articulate. And focus ultrasound came into the second part. We had before focus ultrasound to penetrate with electrodes. Uh, high risks to the brain, maybe a bleeding risk, infectious risk, and displacement of the brain could also reduce the precision of all the technique that we might use. So focus ultrasound was offering the possibility to, in fact, go on doing the same on the basis of what we have found out, but doing it more precisely and much less dangerously. And what until now the results have shown is indeed the case, uh, all the uh, all CD the numbers on the more than 500 uh, interventions uh, performing more than 600 targets. We haven't had a single bleeding, of course, no infection, and the precision is demonstrated to be inside half a millimeter. So we have a chance here, technically, technologically, thanks to focus up sound, to optimize what we can do in terms of precision and safety. And then moving to later on in your career, you also achieved the world first breakthrough in MR guided non invasive neurosurgery, where 10 patients at the University Children's Hospital of Zurich were successfully treated through transcranial focus ultrasound. And this expanded the horizons for neurosurgery and the treatment of different neurological conditions. So, can you tell us more about this study and its impacts? Yeah. It's, it developed then between 2005 and 2009, and the goal was to, uh, for this special indication of functional surgery, to uh, uh, test everything in the sense of feasibility to move to to a uh, human brain. We had to develop uh, uh, research on uh, uh, cadaver heads, etc., and then finally we could have all factors to move into the application, and we chose. My first indication from the beginning, which was you know, neuropathic pain, and had the 11 patient who treat uh, with focus ultrasound. The goal of the study was to check for feasibility, reproducibility of the technique, and also getting first insight into safety and uh, efficacy. And the study was uh, really a, a great success indeed. And uh, we've published the results after a year in 2012 over these 11 patients. That's incredible. And in 2010, you founded the SANA Model Center of Ultrasound Functional Neurosurgery in Zurich. What were some of the first cases you treated at your practice? Um, exactly these three domains. So uh, neuropathic pain, Parkinson, as a whole, not only tremor, and, and essential tremor. So we started uh, since 2011, as you said, and with these three indications. And we had the, the chance to uh, be able to put a trial, uh, an official uh, company-sponsored trial, 2011 to 12, uh, supported by Insightech. Since 13, then we have uh, moved on with our center uh, independently. And then you recently published a follow-up analysis to that trial with 55 patients who were experiencing chronic and therapy-resistant neuropathic pain. Can you talk about the results of that follow-up analysis? Yes. Um, was it, as you mentioned, 55 patients, consecutive patients, and we have a mean follow-up of 55 months. So it's a solid study in the set. It's a large number of patients and uh, a long follow-up, a uh, mean follow-up. Um, the global results can be summarized in the following way. More than uh, 50 patients got a stable over the, all the follow-ups results amounting uh, to more than 50% pain relief. Right? So all 50% pain relief in 50% of patients. Um, there's another way. This is just pain relief, as mentioned by the patient, untouched. And we can also measure the so-called visual analog scale, which allows us to uh, present differently uh, the, the pain relief on the visual uh, display. 
and the reduction of pain in this display was between 40 and 50 percent. The reduction of brain attacks, an important part of neuropathic pain, so for example, in trigeminal pain, it was higher, more than 90 percent, 93 percent. Wow, that's fantastic. And what were some of the reactions from the participants of the trial? Have you heard from them on the positive results that they've been experiencing? Yeah, and we have followed them up, uh, up, up to a year, which was a good thing to do, of course. And uh, the pain relief is always very appreciated. They, all of them, all the patients get to surgery. They've got a chronic therapy-resistant, long-lasting, severe pain condition. So any relief is very much appreciated. Indeed. And are there any other conditions you're particularly interested in or that you see as an important emerging topic in the field? Yeah, well, we have contributed until today uh, mainly the two mentioned fields of Parkinson and sexual tremor and, and published in Sony Model, our center. We have uh, published, I think, around 10 uh, peer review papers on these three fields. And um, the other domain that you mentioned also in my biography uh, that we have explored less in number before. We didn't have the time to really uh, move into them uh, until today. I'm really gladly to uh, uh, the attention and the development of, of other colleagues and teams. We are a field of epilepsy and uh, or neuropsychiatry and, and tinnitus that could be also considered to expand the indication in this approach of functional neurosurgery. And did you have any mentors who helped you succeed in the field or sparked your interest in a different mechanism or clinical indication? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, the first one in time was Professor Hendrik van der Loos, a Dutch neuroanatomist who uh, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, was my mentor for my uh, thesis. I had luck to be introduced by him in all the arcanas of science and um, could do my thesis on neuroplasticity with him. Uh, then came Professor Rodolfo Linas, an immense neurophysiologist, and became a dear friend of mine. And it was great to develop this dysrhythmia concept uh, together. Um, I go a lot of, uh, to him in all the very fruitful discussion and could have all along to have until today. And then came Professor Yasangil, a uh, great uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, my department in Zurich was in, inserted in his neurosurgical clinic, and he has never stopped supporting us and stimulating us all along the time on this field of functional neurosurgery. And his uh, successor, Professor Yonekawa, did all the same, also, till he left. So these are the main matters I can think of. You recently closed the Sana Model Center of Ultrasound Functional Neurosurgery after 14 years. What is it like reflecting on this incredible legacy? Yeah, it's a uh, globally, it's a miraculous, amazing uh, 14 years to consider. Um, having been able to develop a small center, not a center or staff less than 10. Um, uh, administered by a family-based, uh, tiny uh, LTD company, private, and being able, as we endeavored to keep the status of academic medicine, with mentioned 10 papers peer-reviewed in the field, taking benefit of the connection thanks to a uh, digital world, uh, integrating also the very important domain of emotions and feelings in these indications and maintaining the numbers that we discussed before of activity has been a simply uh, amazing adventure. And I'm so delighted that we had the chance and very grateful to have the chance to, to do that together with a very uh, dear and dedicated team. And speaking of legacy, when you look back at all of the work you've done, are there any achievements that you're particularly proud of, or are there any patient stories that stand out to you? Uh, the achievements, I, I, would, I would say, on the scientific level, would be this thalamocortic dyspnea development. And on the clinical uh, dimension, would be this Sony Model 14 years. 
Uh, I have a one or two patient story in phenopathic pain that might be of interest to you. Uh, one was a patient having had a discus, a discal hernia operation in the lumbar sacred area. Uh, the hernia could be taken away, but the compression on the nerve, on the root, sorry, and uh, produced then a typical classical neuropathic pain situation and which could not be controlled by uh, other interventions or any drug intake. So the perfect indication to do uh, neurosurgery in the sense uh, that we do it. So we were performing this target that, that we had described until now um, against neuropathic pain, and the patient suddenly uh, had a cry and stopped everything. It's under local anesthesia, so the patient was uh, having a surprise, so we stopped everything. I came to him, and he told me, uh, it's, it's incredible, I feel my leg again. That was an incredible moment. Do you have time? I have another situation. Oh, sure, yes. <laughs> um, which has been very uh, uh, fruitful for us to realize. It was a, um, a young lady having had a, uh, a brain infarct inside her thalamus. And it was a mis malformation. It was a young person, and uh, she recovered very well from motor uh, losses, but kept then a neurogen, neuropathic pain syndrome in the whole hemibody, contralateral to thalamus, as it's always the case. And we was, and she had a part of a syndrome, syndrome, this allodynia, an extreme sensitivity to the touch on light touch on the skin. It was on the arm and didn't allow her to carry a blouse or anything because any touch on the, on the arm was very painful, like electrical discharge and pins and needles. So we began the work in Target, again on the anesthesia, uh, and uh, the patient began uh, caressing very thoughtfully uh, her arm without a single sign of pain. Wow, that's incredible. We were all massively delighted, of course, yeah. And uh, I let her do for moments for her to integrate the new situation and then came to her and asked her, asked her, do you feel any change now? And she thought two seconds and said, and I was exactly the same. So we finished the work and then on the next day I sat with her because I had to understand what was happening. here. And uh, this is the base of for you to understand that in a series of neuropathic pain uh, and treatments, you cannot expect a close to 100% relief because there's the factor which you see here present, which is psycho-emotional. In pain, frustration can be an issue, as I've showed you in this case and in this study. This needs to be integrated, of course, every time when pain surgery is considered. It doesn't take away the efficiency, but we need to integrate this addition factor very solidly. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I would never consider that aspect that you have to take into account. Uh, but it's great that, you know, some people are able to have that relief or get as close as possible to relief. Yeah. And then if there are psychological elements, they can be then addressed by psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And can then improve further. Uh, after surgery, if they can then uh, reduce their frustration levels or the anxiety, mainly in pain is frustration. Have you heard from any of those um, participants who went on to work with a psychologist um, and has their pain reduced later on? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I am also not, uh, the particular case in mind of a of a lady who had also discal hernia, um, post discal hernia, and um, neuropathic pain situation. And um, the EEG showed before surgery and overactivity where we expected in the pain related sectors. And after surgery, she had only a diffuse overactivity in her own emotional brain, much less strong, but still present. And she had an insufficient relief at the time. And then I had advised her because she was a very um, religious person, an American, uh, very religious person, and advised her to find an environment where she would have psychotherapy uh, compat compatible. 
than with her own uh, religious feelings. And she found that um, in Great Britain, if I remember well. And it came a year later, her EEG was normalized. Wow. And when I asked how she managed to do that, she said, of course, she'd be well supported, but said what I knew was to her, I, I think I quote her correctly, that if God was so perfect, he could have only perfect children and she could not be as bad as she thought she was. Mm. She was a, a nice uh, insight into a very strong emotion factor, mm-hmm. self and and frustration. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so interesting. Well, you've contributed so much research and so much to the field. When did you first hear about the foundation? It must have been in the beginning of the of the Zurich trial. I was supposed around two thousand five, five oh six, and uh, came into contact. And and I had until today always amazing contact with the foundation. We had the support of a project as I was in Zurich. Uh, for for our trials, financial support, uh, and since Sony Volume existed since 2011, of course the very detailed and updated website describing for patients worldwide where the centers are that do the jobs was fundamentally important for us in the sense of having many patients that went to uh, your website and then uh, found the way to us. And I, I cannot mention uh, all of them, but I have many, many amazing contacts with many collaborators. One of them come to my mind uh, is uh, Tim Mika, has been really supportive uh, all in our time. So this is, has been our very positive uh, contact and experience with the foundation. What gave you the courage to try these new treatments that others had not yet tried in humans? Um, I, I was encouraged by, uh, as I mentioned before, by the coverage data. My colleagues in uh, Boston, Brigham Women Institute, that had had to, to move, had the idea to go and do treatments in the brain. They had a much more difficult context with the brain tumors uh, that are more difficult to reach, that can be, etc. Uh, but it really gave me the insight that there was a whole team here really solidly considering this possibility was important for me. And, and then by just considering the way the system had been developed, uh, it made a lot of sense to me. And having these small targets in the set of the brain was really offering an amazing possibility to optimize, as I mentioned before, the safety and efficacy of what we do. So it, it seemed to me to make completely sense. What advice do you have for young neurosurgeons who are using focus ultrasound in the brain? I, I, I think um, the idea that it's important in this field to keep the different dimensions of physiology, anatomy, technology, the machine itself you want to use, and always go to treat by elements of understanding what the mechanism is. I, I think uh, in these days, sometimes empiricism is a bit too strong and uh, there's not enough, in my opinion, always enough uh, interest into what the mechanism is on the basis of which one can decide what to do. And then, in a sense, use the machine as appropriately as possible. So it's just a, a flow of, of work What's the mechanism? What I know about it and what can I do and what offers me the machine to do as appropriately as possible. And, and always in medicine, but in this field particularly, uh, integrate the psychosocial dimension, psycho-emotional, psychosocial dimension. We, in this small group, in this small team, the study model that was amazing, part of this uh, legacy you asked me before, to be able to offer high-tech dimension and scientific dimension, but also uh, almost a family-like uh, feeling a patient could feel uh, supported, understood, and and, uh, and yeah, supported in all the emotional dimension. That's so important, as we discussed. What's next for you after retirement? Um, probably a, a book or two. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Any particular topics? Um, yeah, one topic is um, what we just discussed. And I think emotions are fundamentally important. We've discussed example uh, with this uh, frustration scale yeah, and evidence. So I think it's always useful to insist maybe again about uh, the deep integration of and ideas and emotions when we do medicine. And this is something I had to discover in my, along my, my years of career to and get better into integration of these dimensions. Could explain things that I could not understand before. So one, we, one element, and the other element is also, I gave also an, an insight before, is also then the spiritual dimension. We as human beings are always wondering what happens to us, uh, what is all that? Did I deserve it? Not, etc. Depends on what sort of uh, uh, spiritual or materialistic uh, insight one, one has. And this needs to be considered, uh, I think, and integrated deeply. And I try to do something in this set. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Jean Minaud. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise with us. It was a, indeed a great pleasure. And thank you very much for for that and all the best. This episode of Curing with Sound has been presented by the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. If you would like to learn more about Focused Ultrasound or the foundation, visit our website at fussfoundation.org. You can also sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media.